Hi, Gary Stearman. Time for another update from Prophecy in the News. Uh, this one being made on the 22nd of May for release on Wednesday the 23rd. And we're going to talk about what's going on in Egypt because today, Wednesday, the voting is being held in Egypt that will decide upon Egypt's next president. Who will he be? Well, we have some fascinating things going on there. <clears throat> According to Is Israel Today magazine, and here's the headline as Egyptians pre prepare to vote, the future of peace looks bleak. This is not a good thing for Israel. As Egyptians prepared to elect a new president on Wednesday, that is today, a noted Egyptian philosopher explained that this was not true democracy, and polls suggested the future of relations with Israel did not look promising. So even on the eve of elections, uh, spokespersons for the Islamic Brotherhood said, don't get your hopes up too high. This is not true democracy. This is the election of the Islamic Brotherhood to power. Israelis have been warning since uh, the start of the, what was called the Arab Spring that Egypt's revolution would ultimately result in increased oppression for Egyptians themselves, which it has, by the way. Ask the Coptic Christians who are being killed uh, by the hundreds. And would ultimately, ultimately lead to such a straining of ties with Israel that war would result. Western officials initially brushed aside those concerns, but the recent parliamentary takeover by the Muslim Brotherhood has validated the Israeli position, as everybody knew that it would. Of the four men leading the pack of 13 presidential contenders, two are Islamists, and they are the top two contenders, by the way. Uh, one is uh, named Mohammed Mursi, M-U-R-S-I, not Mursi as we would think of the word. Uh, Mohammed Mursi is the official presidential candidate fielded by the Brotherhood itself, a group that has, by the way, never hidden its hostile feelings toward Israel. The other is Abdel Moneam Abel Fotah. Abel Fotah uh, is a leading Islamist who broke away from the, the Islamic Brotherhood and started his own wing of the Brotherhood, but he is a radical. Uh, when he speaks, he doesn't miss an opportunity to refer to Israel as the enemy state, and he promises, if elected, I will f overthrow Israel. I mean, there's just no, uh, no secret about that at all. Uh, this is what's happening in Egypt even as we speak. Uh, here from Debka file is another aspect of the same problem. The headline here, Israel gives qualified okay to Obama's interim deal with Iran. And so even as the Egyptians are voting, we have a situation in which uh, the Israelis are withholding any movement uh, toward Iran. As you know, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu created a unity government between uh, Likud and Kadima, uh, securing enough seats in the Israeli Knesset that he could uh, declare war and it would be an effective declaration. Many speculated that he was going to declare war against Iran. But now, what has happened? Well, the Obama administration has stepped in and given more or less assurance to the Iranians that Israel would remain static, would, that would not uh, initiate a, a, uh, an invasion. And meanwhile, uh, if you'll step down from developing your nuclear weapons, we will talk peace with you. So the headline here, Israel gives qualified okay, is followed by these words, Israel's Benjamin Netanyahu and Ehud Barak have decided to stand back for Barack Obama to put his interim deal with Iran to the test. Now you may recall that the Obama executive branch through the Saudi Arabian Kingdom is, is uh, funding and arming the, the uh, rebels who ha are attempting to, to put Bashar Assad out of office. At the very same time, they have quashed Israel's uh, 
possible aggressive move toward Iran and have stood up and said, we are going to offer, make you a deal you can't refuse. And to uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, they have said, just stand back for a while and you'll have peace. The Obama administration handed similar assurances to the G8 leaders at Camp David last Saturday, May 19th. Israel's qualified acquiescence to the deal was negotiated by Washington and was accompanied by assertions by its ministers that Iran was lying about its nuclear int intentions and playing the world for a fool. Tehran would therefore not stand up to its test. And even in spite of those declarations, the Israelis have been persuaded, once again, to stand back, to do nothing, as the United States uh, talks peace with Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and the others. In the meantime, uh, the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, has sent men into Iran in an attempt to inspect Iran's nuclear facilities. Everybody is supposedly, quote unquote, standing down for peace talks and an upcoming agreement uh, by Iran that they would give up their nuclear development program. Quite frankly, uh, I totally agree with the Israeli position. Iran is playing the world for a fool right now. And in another story, uh, which I don't have time to relate at the moment, over 90 top nuclear scientists in the world have been gathered together in a essentially what amounts to a crash development uh, uh, drive to complete a stockpile of nuclear weapons in Iran as quickly as possible. And at, at the latest uh, report, these 90 top nuclear scientists uh, who, by the way, are employing literally thousands uh, of uh, lower level uh, experimenters, machinists, welders, all the people doing the necessary tasks of creating uh, nuclear weapons are working day and night with, with no cessation. And so on the one hand, you read about this tremendous drive in Iran to develop nuclear weapons. On the other hand, you read about uh, IAEA stepping in and saying, let's talk peace. And meanwhile, in the background, you have uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and his unity government sitting on their hands doing absolutely nothing. Well, that's the situation in the Middle East. You have uh, Syria in a state of chaos. You have Egypt about to elect an, a Muslim Brotherhood president. And uh, in the middle, you have Israel uh, basically frozen into inaction. And you have the United States uh, playing its cards in Iran. An amazing situation. It's, it's biblical. It's, it's more than biblical. You know, I've felt for a long time that there is a dark power behind Iran and behind Persia. And if you remember in the 10th chapter of Daniel, <clears throat> Daniel prayed for 21 days. He fasted and he prayed. Uh, and he prayed for the Lord's guidance and for the Lord's prophetic insight. And the messenger finally came from the Lord. In fact, the angel of the Lord came to him after 21 days of fasting and prayer. And he said, you know, Daniel, fear not. This is uh, Daniel 10, uh, 11. Fear not. And by the way, <laughs> Good advice for anybody. Uh, reading da uh, let me read down just a little bit. Daniel uh, 10, 12. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and did chasten thyself before the Lord, thy words were heard. And I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Every time I read that, I read that what Paul tells us in the New Testament about principalities and powers ruling forces in the darkness uh, being our real enemy, I always think of Persia. 
the then and now as having a dark ruler, an unseen uh, magisterial ruler. You know, they're called archons in the New Testament, <clears throat> these, these fallen angels who rule kingdoms on earth. And here in Daniel 11 or 1013, the prince of the king of Persia withstood the angel of the Lord 21 days. That's a pretty strong force. And I think that force is still in Persia, which is why Persia has had such success in building herself up in these last days. Ultimately, uh, there is going to be war both on earth and in heaven, and all these forces are going to be unleashed. Uh, and right now, the focus of world power is Syria, Egypt, Iran. It's biblical. What can I say? Keep looking up. <laughs>